So I never understood gender. I always understood femininity because to me, it was always something I was playing. Hi, and welcome to Fem Study, a podcast and media project about fem art, theory, and culture. I'm your host, Jillian Hernandez. I'm a women's studies scholar, author, curator, and Latina femme, obsessed with popular culture and the politics of style. Thank you for joining us. Today, I'm talking to Maria Saldana, a bisexual indigenous Charapa femme who's best known for her work on puteria, healing, and queerness in the Peruvian Amazon. She currently writes the Maria Pero No Santa advice column for them. Our conversation was sparked by Maria's work on an upcoming article for them on the queerness of chonga culture. We touch on how we came to and embody chonganess, how chongas build queer community, and who some of our queer chonga icons are. Soon, the full um, conversation will be available via podcast, so stay tuned for that. Um, references will be in the links below, and I hope you enjoy it. Chongas and Chongis very much, I think, found me um, post-migration. So my mom and I left Iquitos, my hometown, um, I want to say like 99, 2000. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And then migrated to the DR, were there for a bit, and then ended up in Miami. And we first migrated to like Opalaka. Um, And so what would be like a common thing that would happen, you know, my mom was working class. My parents are are very much still working class Um, here in South Florida is that on Sundays we would go to the Pulguero with my mom. Mm -hmm. And there you would see like just rows and rows and rows of like clothes, purses, shoes, like earrings. Um, and so the first time that I, I think saw like the, the, what I see in my mind as the embodiment of a chonga, um, was at a pulguero. And it was when I bought my first pair of chongi earrings with my mom, they were like these blue hoops, they had like blue gems. Um, and it was very much this like full moment of like, there's reggaeton and salsa playing from like radios around there is right. And there's the, this. Chonga that's telling me like look mommy these are gonna look so cute um and I already was in my mind dressed apart as this kid I had like these glittery jeans I had this tube top on so for me it was very much just like a right like that piece that solidified it in a way Mm -hmm. um and was very much so something that was not rejected at that time by my mom or my family I only started seeing more so this kind of worry of what the term chonga not even just the term but like all the meanings that were attached to exactly Mm -hmm. when I started to grow up a little bit more opalaka and I started in my family's eyes to get a little too comfortable right in the streets and so that was really like the the pieces that suddenly were attached not just to chonga right but then buta started to come out real quick as like a little kid you hear it like all the ways that like apparently chongas were seen as deviant they were seen as like easy in all of these ways um that just started to kind of um not turn me off necessarily but it actually ended up migrating my family throughout South Florida um and we eventually like found ourselves in like I went I was going to school in like predominantly white schools like it was such a shift, I think, from when we first got to Miami. Oh, for sure. Yeah, because yeah. Opalaka is also like very African American yeah. and Afro-Caribbean. And I also want to yeah. be clear that when we say when when we're saying Latinx and Chonga here, like we're definitely like to me that always includes Afro um Latinx mm-hmm. people and understanding yeah. that Chonga style is an African diasporic product. But that makes sense to me in many ways because we've seen historically how like the way to shore up proper femininity is to disassociate it from black. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, and there's also, I think, right, and you touched on this when you were sharing, but um the reclamation that's I think happening now. Um also I think what's coming with it, um, and I mentioned this a little bit, but is that you know, these like what are now called like the clean girl aesthetic 
which to me is very much the slicked hair, the lip gloss, the, Mm -hmm. you know, like the ways in which um, these aesthetics are, are starting to be seen as um, something that white women can use and wear to look more respectable in many ways. Like is so, I mean, to me, I'm just like, it's not surprising, but it's still like, it it takes a bit for me to like swallow. (laughs) Yeah. I think because it's so like, oh, so you can use these, right? Like you can have these aesthetics and still navigate the world in a way that chongas to this day can't. And, and the ways that like, yeah, there's a, there's a, an appropriation that I think is happening simultaneously too. Um, and then you also named the, the Chunga Licious video, um, which I mean, I was really young when that came out. So that was something that um, like cousins and like close friends were listening to. And that was the, uh, I think one of the most requested or like repeated songs at the time. It was like, huge. Power Nin- like Power 96 was like blasting that all the time. And I'm like, <laughs> now I'm like, they were basically like overlapping on Fergalicious, right? So yeah. Um, and I think even recently Laguni Chonga performed Chongalicious live, I think, um, during like a pride event or something like that. So it's just curious the way that I mean there was this this strange way that it was both a parody, but also like a way that at least friends and I were identifying with the with what was being said in the lyrics. So like yes. the high art eyebrows, the lip liner, the the hoops with like the the names on them. Um, but it was still like a parody. And so it mm-hmm. was just a very strange place to like be witnessing and now looking back it's been years and years like over 10 years I think since that video has come out um and it's still one still being streamed and watched and and again being performed by people like like Winnie Chonga who's like queen in my eyes yeah yeah but there's something there also I think in the ways that they were being like you know in the spotlight at that very specific point in time so, I mean, I remember also in my chonginess was, I mean, queerness was always there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think particularly in the ways that I would like, like romanticize and um, and like always crush on chongis in particular. So <laughs> to me, they always, right, their lips, I like what attracted to their lips, their lip gloss is popping always. Um, they always smell like violetas or herbal essence, right? The leaving, like, oh the my god, dish, like, herbal essence. You like just took in it there. math That's class, hundred. Like in math class, there was always the chongis in my class, and they just smelled amazing. And so, of mm-hmm. course, there was a natural like attraction to me. My queerness was always known. Um, but I'm really curious how you see, or if you see, a relationship between chongis and queerness i do i definitely do i mean i think that chonga aesthetics are queer at the outset even when they are on people who like don't even identify as such um because i do think that it's an aesthetic that embraces the performativity of femininity like femininity to me like is queer um outright and so I feel like and I think a lot about Jose Esteban Munoz's work on like Chusmeria Mm -hmm. and how you know Chusmeria which definitely is part of the Chongi universe right um how that is a queer sort of performance it's like a queer um you know feminine performance Jose Esteban Munoz also links that um to class very much which is also racialized right and so I think that there is a kind of inherent like campiness um, that and modes of femininity and self-fashioning that are in conversation with things like drag that are in conversations with like the super effeminate like hairstylist that your mama sees, Mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, the, you know, the makeup artist, the nail tech. So to me, it's like, part of this um overall world of working class femininity that of which queerness has always been like such a huge part and such a huge like innovative part so there's that 
But then I also think on the other side, the queerness that you're talking about of a kind of um, erotic pull through the aesthetics, like the, 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 the shine of the jewelry and the lip gloss and all of that um, as a kind of homosocial um, and sometimes avowedly queer kind of, um, you know, relation and sociality like that, that definitely um, that definitely has been there. I think that even in like Charapa culture, I always see like to this day and even then see threads of chonganis in mm-hmm. our culture. And I think one, it's primarily because Charapas are seen as um, the lowest in the in the hierarchy, I think, in, in mm-hmm. culture um, and particularly Charapa women. Um because of the very same aesthetics that I see play out in Chonga. So it's like the lip liner, the, the, eye, the eyebrows, the nails, the hoops, um, the tight clothing. I mean, it's hot in, you know, in La Selva. And so for me, I'm like, I, I don't know how I'm supposed to be wearing a sweater. <laughs> like, I know. Like, you know, and all, but right. all of a sudden those things become oh, it's hot there. That must mean that you are, you know, always like prendida in a way. So like always kind of like sexual, mm-hmm. easy. Um, and that's mm-hmm. like a much larger con- like historical context of, of charapas. Um, but it's the same ways that I see, like you go to the hair salons here in Miami um, that you have queer folks um, and a feminine, I think, gay men in particular working on you know your your titi's hair your mom's hair the same way that we have them in in iquitos very much so and i think a really unique way that queerness and transness in particular play out in iquitos in that way like Mm -hmm. it's almost like performing of like hyper femme that um i feel like i was always brought up on so i never understood gender i always understood femininity because to me it was always something i was playing Oh, and I, I feel like, that. yeah, so I feel like for me, like when this whole, like, whenever, like, I think of gender in particular, sometimes chongi even feels like even I struggle saying chongi because to me, chonga in itself is like, doesn't necessarily speak to gender. It speaks more so to like this embodied way of like performing and aesthetic, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, no, definitely. Yeah. And so I think I learned what it meant to be femme or what gender it could look like through that, like through uh, like specific aesthetics, through um, like behaviors with other chungi femmes. Um, and it was very much in this like homoerotic way, I think that like you would hold your best friend's hands. But then the second, like that, oh, feelings developed, whatever, when you got older, that was like taboo. That was something that you didn't really speak Mm -hmm. about. Um, But that or were always there. Like there was always like a natural, I think, care that was coming out. Um, That to me screamed queer, very much so, like besides like how we were performing gender. But it was like the relationships or like those femme friendships and relationships that Chungis have. Um, that I see even now that I think marked a lot of my own upbringing or like understandings of my gender, how I was reading gender on other people. This, um, I write about also um, Judy Baca, the Chicana feminist artist, like super important work called Las Tres Marias and the performance that she did. And Judy Baca, I didn't know. And, and it's not something that's super foregrounded in her work, but she's a lesbian. And so thinking, and and she's talked in interviews about how her embodying the chola, she does like this pachuca chola makeover Mm -hmm. on herself and how that was like this act of her claiming this femininity that like her mom never allowed her to. And she literally talks about remembering like um, these cholas in the schoolyard who would like walk around like linking arms and that this was this way that they like took up space and you knew that even though they were super femme like you didn't mess with them and mm-hmm. some of them would have like razors in their hair that yeah. they could like pull out if you mess with them right so I do think like the queerness the gender nonconformity has always been there um, and so you know to me it's kind of sad that like for many of us our entry point to it is through parody or through this kind of performance that we need to do like decades later 
Mm-hmm. Or even me in my in my twenties, finally coming to grips with like, you know, why did it bother me to be compared to a Brad doll? Like, mm-hmm. what well, what the hell was going on there, right? Um, so if there's any sort of, um, you know, um, I don't know the the sort of political potential of the queerness of Chonganis would be precisely that kind of feeling of bodily autonomy that folks could claim like now, Mm -hmm. um, you know, before, and it's cool to claim it later. Anytime you come to it, if that's, if that's you and your authentic self, but, um, so many of us had to grow up like disassociating from something that was uniquely ours to then try to assimilate to something that one, like we were never going to be read as legitimate in any way. Um, and that was stifling of our own desire, both in terms of aesthetic desire, but also like sexual too, or just like that bodily autonomy. Like, yeah, you mentioned at the beginning, right? Like everything that's happening in Florida, like, this is all about controlling people's bodies, um, yeah. from, you know, from deviating from gender or sexuality in any way. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I think Chonga politics gets to that very question but i'm i'm excited to see what y'all are doing with chonga culture and like people like laguni chonga and in that piece i mentioned where i write about judy baka i, ta- I write about julacy mm-hmm. and, and carla who you know t- two queer folks who um one night were trying to um they were trying to get into a club for free and the way they did it was by like dressing as chongas because it was like ladies night <laughs> so- yeah so they dressed like chokies and that's how they got in for free. And people were living for it. They were like, they were barbudo. <laughs> like they had yeah. beards. They were queer math people with beards and people <laughs> loved it. And so they started to do this performance as, as chongas, as Julesi and Carla. And you know what I write about is how like something that was just started as just like with Chongalicious, right? Like mm-hmm. to young broke people. Young broke people in Miami trying to figure out what they're going to do for a night. Chongalicious was like, we're going to make a video with our friends. They're like, we're going to try to get into this club for free. Turns into a cultural movement because Julesi and Carla started to get a following. And eventually that started this queer night downtown called Counterculture, Mm -hmm. which was a party, a queer party in which um, up and coming, you know, baby queers like Jupiter Velvet, for example, like would start to perform so we're talking about like trans femmes of color right um really experimental forms of drag that in Miami even though there's a lot of drag it's like very much catered to tourism right like very particular kinds of aesthetics so to think that like chonganess and and chonga drag created this like very rich queer um subculture in Miami, like tells you something again mm-hmm. about about the potential of that. Um, I think um, of you know, the the context that we're currently in. One, I have seen nightlife in particular, and this queer and trans like chongi nightlife be life saving for a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and also, I think where I have seen. Or where I have felt the most, like my body or chonginess the most visible in a way that reminded me that there's no like safety almost. Um, But at the same time, like holding, right, like having community around me that was still doing, and and you speaking of of this um, subculture that emerged, right, um, in particular, like this, this trans, like transness, but also drag that was not being catered to tourism. And I think of like our house, right. That's like very much like when you're in Miami, Mm -hmm. you're going to go to our house with your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I think of like, what's currently going on, right. There's sometimes I'm like, y'all lack imagination in making these bills because how are you like, I don't know how you confine right the, the subculture that comes out of um chonganess, queerness, transness, because to me it's like not able to be like right stated as like a, a bill or law that can like easily point to what to look of out for the fee. So to me, I'm just like, right, there's a lack of almost um 
currently, I think in discussions that that I hear about Florida being an unsafe space, or the, like there's a lack of nuance. And also, I think imagination in folks who are not currently here and have not lived in the communities, have not been emerged in culture, in this specific culture, um, because I still find like, like I don't, f- I currently don't find a need to escape where I'm currently at. It's not like I don't feel the state on my on my neck. Um, yeah, but there's just the way that it it, go- it like to me moves so beyond um, bills and and policies. Um, not Absolutely, that very much impact people day to day. Of course. Um, yeah, but to me, it just goes beyond. Like, it's something that I don't think it can can be captured, labeled, confined in like this neat way. And I think that's the point um, of Chonganis is that a lot of times, and I think you named this very clearly, it burns, right? It like makes class mm-hmm. burn. It like really has us reimagine how we are um, seeing racialized gender playing out um, throughout Miami, I think. Yeah, it's embedded in everything. Like it's 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 like you can't disentangle it, yeah. even as these bills attempt to artificially do that. Like you cannot. Like yeah. these trans folks and queer folks and chongis have like aunties, brothers, sisters, like at all levels and all places of society, um, who are not happy about this. So I think. Um, you know, again, same as you, I do want to name that there are real ramifications, but also resist this sort of um, call from people who aren't even from here to be like, oh, like, it's unsafe. Like, it's unsafe anywhere on this yeah. soil. Um, and also not all of us have the luxury yeah. to go nor want to go, right? And who's going to be here for the folks who can't for whatever reason. So thank you also for naming that. I think of Chungis as being culture shifters, but also community builders. Um, and so I'm just curious how you've seen Chungis engage or, or build community in Miami and throughout South Florida. Mm-hmm. For me, like more um, going back to Julie and Carla, like that, that to me was just like this inspiring example of seeing, um, you know, this very queer form of Chunga embodiment and re- and relationality literally create space and place and and community um and then that sort of triggering these other connections like I remember one night I went to counter corner and the DJ was like fucking killing it and I was like who is this fam like playing this music and then that's how I met Coochie Fruit which is this like Afro Latina amazing you know femme DJ from Chicago but who's from Miami and so like just the permutations and like the culture of abundance one of our favorite things mm-hmm. to talk about um that emerges you know from that culture so for me um both that but also like what Laguni Chonga has done like let's just be real mm-hmm. like what an ambassador of yeah. um Chonga culture like internationally on the west coast also um and you know from Miami like this this is no one pretending <laughs> there's receipts there's archival (laughs) photography chongi chongi cred (laughs) like you have your stamp of approval um and and especially because as we're seeing like rosalia and these other folks um you know rise Mm -hmm. in in the culture and and you see that laguni like has been there and has done that um and is not pretending to take on these these aesthetics like she was a stripper like she like this is not a joke this is yeah. like cute to her right yeah. um and so to see her um start to get her flowers and create those spaces that other chongis are going to just to have a night of dancing or just to listen to that music as you're getting ready to go out right mm-hmm. at night um you know that is also like a, another um super important form of of um creating culture and and also like let's just the city girls to me are like honorary chongis too like yes. you know uh-huh. amb- ambassadors of of miami femininity yeah. to the 10th degree um and chonga culture definitely owes so much to both afro-latinx femmes and african-american femmes 
Um, and so I see, I see their embodiment and the culture mm-hmm. around the city girls as definitely being in conversation. And I love, like, you hear it even in their references, like, yeah. they'll reference, like, Cubans and the Cuban girl at Tootsie's or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Even their, their song right now is like, piñata, like, yeah, through yeah city girls I love them so much for real no that's so true and I mean um the I mean even young Miami and JT right the the I think their name the city girls came from the the label or the desire to right everybody's like uh, like their whole thing was like everybody wants to be with a city girl and yet they're coming from like young Miami's like from Opalaka yes and yes. and like jt yes. from liberty city you know and yes. I, so i'm just like there's i mean that's to me like i don't see i mean i'm not saying that chongas don't live in brickle <laughs> right but, but like, yeah like if but, we're really but, talking if right. we're really if we're really talking we're talking all yeah. about uh yes we're talking liberty city yes we're talking hylia opalaka mm-hmm. Miami yeah. Lakes. Miami Lakes. Also, shout out Rosemary Romero of Poor Nails. Huge shout out. Oh my god. Um, hey. talking about Chunga aesthetics and uh-huh. and community building, right? So she had this like mobile, um, nail project called Poor Nails, where she would like you know do people's nails as a form of relational artwork and choose media as artwork, and I was really so thrilled to include her in a show I curated in Miami in 2014 and like doing doing dudes nails like doing little girls nails and the aesthetics are very flea market you know um but she's from Miami Lakes and she grew up in that this is not you know what I mean um so yeah huge shout out um well profe I guess my last question um since we're talking about the ways we've been (laughs) showing up um is how would you embody or how do you embody Chongivity activity? I think I am very sonically loud. And I always have been since I was little. And I remember that being something that would bring me shame because I wouldn't realize it. And everyone's like, Jill, like everyone can hear what you're saying. Literally every eh, (laughs) girl, if you thought you were being slick, like, no, like everyone literally heard um and but I do think what's something that was actually kind of shameful and that people used to like roll their eyes at me about um has become a strength of mine because I think it makes me a good profe Mm -hmm. you can hear me in lecture (laughs) you can hear me in lecture um but yeah I think mostly in my in my sonic in my sonic voice in in how I dress and also in in my attention to other femmes you know, and my valuing of other femmes, which is something that I'm investigating more and writing about more in my work right now, because I think that's actually um, how we survive quite literally Mm -hmm. um, is by recognizing each other and supporting each other. Yeah. Thank you, Profe. And like, you... um, were such an inspiration to me in undergrad because I think I got to UF and I was like what is this white is that place um and then very quickly realized how like if I look back at my freshman year I was not wearing my hoops like I was not like sporting my nail mm-hmm. and that changed over time mm-hmm. um and then by the time I was in your class, it was my senior year. And I was like, I'm all in. Like, I'm ready. <laughs> like, like, no, I'm you came ready. in like you were marinating. Yeah. And now we're going ready. in the oven. I was ready. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. Thank yeah. you so much. 